All right, it's time to give a huge shout out to the sponsor of today's episode, happyhippo.com. So if you guys haven't checked this out, you got to go to happyhippo.com because they have some of the highest quality Kratom products that I've ever come across. And if you guys aren't familiar with what Kratom is, it's an herbal substance that has many different uses, everything from uh, a balanced mind to energy. You can It can help you relax. And my wife and I, uh, over the last couple of weeks, have tried out some of their products. And I have to say, it has improved her sleep specifically. She's very anxious and her mind runs at night and it has helped her fall asleep and stay asleep. She actually was using one of the uh, powders that comes in a pouch from Happy Hippo and uh, just dropped it into her water and you know off she went and she was just she, she was very happy. Let me just put it that way. And so myself during the workday, uh, if you guys didn't know, I have a big boy job. I, I work uh, in, in contract management and I need that balance. I need the energy during the day. And they have something called Hyper Hippo and an energy shot. And those energy shots come in those little tiny bottles. You guys are familiar with it from other brands that uh, use that type of packaging, but there's nothing like this, all right? This energy shot, I take it, easy to take, and within minutes, I feel the effects. There's no massive crash after I take it either, which is a huge deal, right? How many energy drinks have you taken uh, and coffee have you drank throughout the day that just leads to the massive crash? Well, this doesn't, and it's, it's an all-natural herb. And I'm telling you right now, it will help you get through your day. It can help you relax, depending on that the type of product you're looking for. Happy Hippo delivers. And guess what? Right now, if you have an order of 200 or more, you can get free next day FedEx shipping. And also, their stuff tastes great. So check out happyhippo.com. Support the WWE podcast and Happy Hippo. And do yourself a favor as well, guys. I'm telling you right now. If it can help my wife go to sleep for somebody as anxious as she is and as somebody that needs as much energy as I do during the day to to do this podcast and to uh, do my job during the day, check out happyhippo.com. Whether you're trying to relax or whether you need energy or balance during the day, happyhippo.com. Stone Cold, the Hellraiser is back. Oh. Evolution of the Shield. John Cena versus the Show. Stop her. Hulk Hogan and The Rock in the same ring. You will never take my place at the head of the table. Undertaker on the Hell's Gate submission. Oh my God. What? My God, Michaels just kicked Cena's head off. The Monday Night Wars have come to WrestleMania. It will be The Rock. It will be Austin one on one. Hey, what's going on, guys? And welcome back to WWE Retro on the WWE Podcast on this Friday, August 18th, as we creep closer and closer towards the end of summer, as it is just absolutely insane how fast summer goes by these days. And especially if you're up here in Canada or the northeastern United States, you blink and three or four months later, it is over and you are getting ready for fall. But in the wrestling world, we usually get accustomed to a lull around this time. Matt and I have spoken about it, that you have the annual lull after WrestleMania and then usually an annual lull after SummerSlam. And this time around, we are getting ready for payback and then fast lane before the next big pay-per-view in Survivor Series. But the period and the pay-per-views that takes place on b- between SummerSlam and Survivor Series has been kind of shifting for the last several years. Payback has seemed to be a consistent theme as they brought back Backlash. Payback was originally done in late April or early May as the payback for uh, WrestleMania. But with Backlash moving back into the rotation, they've moved Payback following SummerSlam. But then you've also kind of had a rotating cast of pay-per-views to follow payback you know for a while we had hell in a cell in october that was kind of like a hallmark of early october for quite some time last year we saw extreme rules take that place the return of bray wyatt we've had crown jewel at times in late october early november way back in the day we had the pay-per-views taboo tuesday or no mercy in the month of october 
So this has always kind of been a period where WWE has shifted the the pay-per-views that they would have. But one pay-per-view that was always the one to follow SummerSlam in my early recollection of watching wrestling was Unforgiven. And Unforgiven was the September pay-per-view. It was always the pay-per-view that would follow SummerSlam. And when the brand split came into effect, it was almost always, I think it was always, I don't even think it was ever belonging to SmackDown at any point, a Raw exclusive um, uh, show. So Unforgiven, obviously on the B-level side of pay-per-views, I don't think that they've had a Unforgiven for at least 15 years now. Like It's been quite a while because then you even had Night of Champions take the place of uh, Unforgiven as well that kind of slid into the um the the spot of uh of of the September show and this was a pay-per-view that even though it was a B-level pay-per-view Unforgiven that is we had some pretty significant matches and title changes go on here in 2001 you had The Rock successfully defend the WCW championship against Booker T and Shane McMahon in a um in a handicap match at that very same pay-per-view, you had Kurt Angle defeat Stone Cold Steve Austin for the WWF Championship. In 2003, you had Goldberg dethrone Triple H for the World Heavyweight Championship. In 2004, you had Triple H defeat Randy Orton for the World Heavyweight Championship just one month after um, Orton had won his first ever world title. In 2003, you had Shane McMahon and Kane go to war and won the more memorable and often not talked about um, last man standing matches and their very, very historic rivalry, at least as far as I'm concerned. So we get into the year 2006. And 2006, near the end of the Unforgiven era in WWE, and the landscape is much different from the past Unforgivens. You have the WWE Championship as now the prominent title on Monday Night Raw. You have Triple H and Shawn Michaels reuniting as Degeneration X. You have the McMahons side by side with the Big Show, locked horns with Degeneration X, like coming to a head at this pay per view. You have Trish Stratus, arguably the best uh, women's wrestler of all time to this point in time in 06 on her way out, all being held in front of the Toronto crowd at what was then known as the Air Canada Center. And the WWE Championship on the line uh, with Edge defending it in his hometown against John Cena in a TLC match, the match that Edge himself made famous. So there were a lot of underlying storylines kind of barreling towards a head at this point in time in WWE. And to to really think about how significant this pay-per-view felt as a non-A-level pay-per-view, as a B-level pay-per-view, a pay-per-view that doesn't even exist anymore, kind of tells you all you need to know about the significance of this particular Unforgiven. And not just Unforgiven uh, in 06, but kind of the history of it. And how, you know, at this point in time, usually following SummerSlam, we were accustomed to a pay-per-view that had so much lineage to it. And 2006 in Toronto was one of the better ones. So we get the party started in a match for the Intercontinental Championship with Johnny Nitro defending it against Jeff Hardy in a match that went 17 minutes and 36 seconds with Johnny Nitro successfully retaining the Intercontinental Championship. And it was crazy just to think that, you know, Johnny Nitro breaking away from Eminem along with Melina, who I believe was his real-life girlfriend at the time, uh, becomes kind of a staple in that mid-card scene in um, on Monday Night Raw. And one-on-one in a feud with Jeff Hardy, just an absolutely great feud to kick off the show, a great match, and a really fun match for the mid-card championship. Then Kane versus Umaga went 7 minutes and 3 seconds, 
that ended in a double countout. Kane and Umaga kind of had a feud that started in the summer, spilled out into the fall, kind of monster versus, versus monster. Umaga had been on the scene for, I believe, four months at this point in time. He debuted after WrestleMania 22 in April of 2006. So they were trying to push Umaga as a big monster heel, and obviously Kane was kind of like uh, the elder statesman of monster heels in WWE, so he kind of uh, was the, the benchmark for Umaga to face off against. Then the spirit squad of Kenny and Mikey uh, defending the World Tag Team Championships against the Highlanders, Robbie McAllister and Roy McAllister, in 8 minutes and 59 seconds, they successfully retained the championships. Uh, the uh, the Highlanders didn't last long. Obviously, they were they were from Scotland. They were kind of like the the predecessors to the Viking Raiders in a lot of ways. Like obviously, the Viking Raiders more of a Scandinavian descent. At least the characters are supposed to be maybe Norwegian. But the Highlanders always kind of struck me as uh, the. I don't know, like the toned down version, the less serious version of the Viking Raiders. Um, They didn't last long. I was going to say they didn't have as much success as the Viking Raiders, but I mean, I don't think the Viking Raiders have had that much success in their own rights. They were kind of like, what would happen if the Viking Raiders and Drew McIntyre meshed together? (laughs) That was basically the Highlanders, but they never really did much of significance. And the Spirit Squad, I'm, I'm sure not many of you guys remember them, They were the ones to dethrone uh, Big Show and Kane for the World Tag Team Championships uh, following WrestleMania 22. Uh, And we covered Big Show and Kane as a tag team two weeks ago and how dominant of a force they really were to to really dominate that tag team scene on Monday Night Raw and kind of reignite their careers in a lot of ways. It was a really good uh, kick in the backside for Big Show and Kane and really changed their characters as a whole after it was kind of getting stale in late 2005. And the Spirit Squad, who was fresh off of a feud with um, with uh, Degeneration X, kind of like a spinoff of the McMahons and Degeneration X, the Spirit Squad kind of became like the henchmen to the McMahon family. So uh, they get back on the on their winning ways. Then we get to... The three-on-two handicap hell in a cell match that went 25 minutes and five seconds of Degeneration X, Shawn Michaels, and Triple H versus The Big Show, the then ECW world champion, Mr. McMahon, and Shane McMahon. And I gotta tell you, as far as hell in a cell matches go, this is one that isn't talked about a lot. But man, was it gory, was it bloody, it made a lot of sense, it was kind of slow at times, but uh, I remember the match started with them each, uh, Shawn Michaels and Triple H simultaneously kicking uh, Big Show in the balls and takes him out of uh, action, they actually did it twice, but you know, the, Shane McMahon has always put his lo- like his body on the line, um, there was a really graphic scene where Shawn Michaels gave him the, the elbow drop from the top rope uh, with the ladder wrapped around his neck and he was coughing up blood. And um, it, it, <laughs> the ending to this match in particular was one that was not only humorous, but pretty graphic at the same time.
So first they give Vince McMahon a stink face, pretty much, um, at the expense of the big show. Then he, Vince McMahon hits a, or eats rather, a sweet chin music. And then Triple H breaks a sledgehammer over the back of his head. And to this day, I'm not exactly sure how they pulled off the sledgehammer spot. Like, if you go back and watch it, like... I guess he kind of hits the shaft of it across the back of the neck, upper shoulder area, but it snaps. Like, it completely snaps off, and obviously they had to design the, the piece of wood in a way that uh, would break on impact like that, but it was a very grueling match, and in a lot of ways, this was kind of like the final time we would see Vince McMahon in a program of this magnitude um, from a physical standpoint. Obviously, that following WrestleMania, he would feud with Donald Trump. Uh, but like, I guess I well, I guess the following year he would feud with Bobby Lashley as well, and then they would have Bret Hart, and then he would team with Triple H and Shane to go up against Legacy. So I guess this wasn't the final time we saw Vince McMahon in a physical capacity. But it felt like this was one of the more one of the last significant programs that we would see Vince McMahon in, and you know he I guess two thousand and six he's what seventy nine now seventy eight now so my math isn't very good as I always say but that's seventeen years ago wow seventeen years ago that's nuts to absolutely say so he was in his early sixties we'll put it like that he was in his early sixties. So it was about time that he starts that he started to wrap up his in ring career uh, slowly but surely, and even for Shane McMahon, like I think that beyond Shane McMahon's return against uh, the Legacy, uh, I think this was probably the last time we would see Shane in kind of like an in ring capacity. Maybe against Bobby Lashley though. That whole Bobby Lashley feud with the McMahons, which was very forgettable. I mean, anyway, we won't get into it, but a very significant program for the McMahons, all in all, and arguably their most uh, their most memorable, aside from Stone Cold Steve Austin, and it all culminated with Degeneration X at this Unforgiven pay per view, 
And this was something that started with Shawn Michaels all the way back in January, had a one-on-one match between Vince and Shawn at WrestleMania 22, and then ultimately goes all the way until um, until September. So between Vince and, Sh- Vince and Shawn and then DX and the McMahons, it was a program that lasted just about nine months. Then we move on to Trish Stratus versus Lita. In a match that was highly anticipated, two of the more significant women in the history of the company and certainly the two most popular women uh, in WWE at the time. Trish is on her way out, retiring. Well, we didn't know that 17 years later she would be back in a pretty much full-time capacity. But in 2006, she was ready to step away. And Lita, side-by-side with Edge... Um, The women's champion uh, was the perfect person to send Trish on her way out. The only question was, was how would Trish go out? All right, it's time to give a huge shout out to the sponsor of today's episode, HappyHippo.com. So if you guys haven't checked this out, you got to go to HappyHippo.com because they have some of the highest quality Kratom products that I've ever come across. And if you guys aren't familiar with what Kratom is, it's an herbal substance that has many different uses, everything from uh, a balanced mind to energy. You can It can help you relax. And my wife and I, uh, over the last couple of weeks, have tried out some of their products. And I have to say, it has improved her sleep specifically. She's very anxious, And her mind runs at night and it has helped her fall asleep and stay asleep. She actually was using one of the uh, powders that comes in a pouch from Happy Hippo and uh, just dropped it into her water and, you know, off she went. And she was just she she was very happy. Let me just put it that way. And so myself during the workday, if you guys didn't know, I have a big boy job. I I work uh, in, in contract management and I need that balance. I need the energy during the day. And. They have something called Hyper Hippo and an energy shot. And those energy shots come in those little tiny bottles. You guys are familiar with it from other brands that uh, use that type of packaging. But there's nothing like this, all right? This energy shot, I take it, easy to take. And within minutes, I feel the effects. There's no massive crash after I take it either, which is a huge deal, right? How many energy drinks have you taken uh, and coffee have you drank throughout the day that just leads to the massive crash? Well, this doesn't. And it's, it's an all-natural herb. And I'm telling you right now, it will help you get through your day. It can help you relax depending on that the type of product you're looking for. Happy Hippo delivers. And guess what? Right now, if you have an order of 200 or more, you can get free next day FedEx shipping. And also their stuff tastes great. So check out happyhippo.com. Support the WWE podcast and Happy Hippo. And do yourself a favor as well, guys. I'm telling you right now, if it can help my wife go to sleep for somebody as anxious as she is and as somebody that needs as much energy as I do during the day to, to do this podcast and to uh, do my job during the day, check out happyhippo.com. Whether you're trying to relax or whether you're, you need energy or balance during the day, happyhippo.com.
So on her way out, Trish Stratus wins the women's championship against Lita, making her submit to the sharpshooter, which Jerry Lawler eloquently says the most Canadian submission move or something along those lines. A very Canadian move, obviously, with the history of Bret Hart and all that. But one thing I just to comment on watching that clip back, and I don't mean to, you know, dump on this match, but it is crazy how far women's wrestling has come. Like Lita and Trish in their time were two of the best, two of the best of all time, period. Uh, trailblazers in a lot of ways. But like when you watch the quality of the match from 17 years ago, as opposed to Bianca Belair, Charlotte Flair, Rhea Ripley, Bailey, Becky Lynch, the wrestlers of today, Sasha Banks when she was in WWE, it is, it's absolutely insane how, how far women's wrestling has come and how athletically just impressive the women are nowadays and how you could come away from a mat from a pay-per-view oftentimes now saying like man the women absolutely blew that out of the water and was the match of the night and uh, not to say that uh, trish and lita were bad they were put on admirable matches and were two of the best at this point in time but uh, a match that goes 11 and a half minutes and trish goes out on top as the wwe women's champion and Lita would step away from wrestling to uh, just a few short months later. Then a bit of a uh, a come down match in a lot of ways. We have Randy Orton defeat Carlito in eight minutes and forty one seconds. A very forgettable period in Randy Orton's career. Uh, Two thousand and six. I mean, uh, he really did not have a lot going on. Uh, I mean, like you have Degeneration X in a Hell in a Cell. You have John Cena versus Edge for the for the WWE Championship main event in the show. Um, it was just a weird time for Randy Orton. I, I read something actually last week that he was being punished because of his dad. Because his dad had a uh, match with The Undertaker in Hell in a Cell. But he was tested positive for Hepatitis A or Hepatitis C or something. And uh, didn't tell anyone. And Randy Orton was getting punished at the same time along with being just a bad locker room guy so crazy to see randy orton just somewhat in a throwaway match against carlito in eight minutes and 41 seconds then we get to the main event match john cena challenging edge for the wwe championship in a tlc match and had john cena lost he would have went to smackdown so john cena had been kind of in chase mode for this wwe championship since early june when he lost the title to Rob Van Dam at uh, One Night Stand. Uh, Edge was the man who costed John Cena the championship, showing up and have a leather jacket and a motorcycle helmet. Then Rob Van Dam gets busted in real life for possession and I believe a DUI, and he drops the title to Edge on, I believe, it was at Vengeance or it might have been on Monday Night Raw, but it was in late June. Van Dam held the WWE championship for less than a month. So Edge had been the WWE champion, his second WWE championship in in that calendar year. Obviously, Edge had cashed in on John Cena at New Year's uh, Revolution 
in early January and subsequently dropped it that same month month at the Royal Rumble to John Cena. So Edge now on his second run as WWE champion in 06 and him and John Cena, a very historic feud uh, that culminates here at Unforgiven in 06 in Edge's hometown in his match and an opportunity to send John Cena back to a brand where he started and a brand that he had not been a part of for about 14 months or 15 months actually since being drafted to Monday Night Raw in early June of 2005. So the card seemingly stacked against John Cena, Edge on a very solid run in his second stint as WWE champion, and it begged the question that in a match that went over 25 minutes, how John Cena would ultimately come out the other side. So John Cena ends the match by not only, not only FUing, and yes, FUing, not attitude adjusting at the time, but FUing Alita, but then also doing the same to Edge off the top of a 20-foot ladder through two tables. And John Cena, I, I don't think he gets enough credit for his facial reactions. Like we've often, like recently, we've been praising Roman Reigns for that quality. But John Cena, the way that he could kind of tell a story with his face I thought that he never got his his uh, his true recognition for that. And when the match ended, it was almost like he just he couldn't believe where he had to take himself, what level he had to go to defeat Edge. And I also think that in a losing effort, this was almost the kind of th- match that solidified Edge as a main eventer and positioned him that in let's say a year's time he would be a consistent world champion because it was I believe in the summer of 2007 after taking the briefcase away from Mr. Kennedy that he would go over to Smackdown cash in on the Undertaker and become the world heavyweight champion a a championship that he held more than once until he um, eventually retired in 2011 I believe it was so and he would kind of become the face of SmackDown in a lot of ways. Main eventing WrestleMania 24 with The Undertaker. Triple threat match with The Big Show and John Cena at WrestleMania 25. 
uh, defending the world championship against uh, Chris Jericho, or I believe he was challenging Jericho for the world championship. Like from WrestleMania 24 all the way until 27, Edge was in every single match for the world heavyweight championship at WrestleMania. Um, so, and I really do think that this match was what put him over as a consistent main eventer and believable because yes, he lost, but it was to the guy who would be the face of the company for the following seven or eight years and had been the face of the company for well, for well over a year at this point, but also showing what he would be able to endure in a match that he made famous along with others and in his home city. So, I mean... For a B-level pay-per-view, Unforgiven 2006 was one hell of one, and I would highly suggest you guys to go check it out. But anyways, that's all I got for you today. I hope you enjoyed this coverage of Unforgiven 2006. As always, you can get me on Twitter at Adamarka25. You can get Matt on Twitter at Wrestling underscore Audio, or you can email him each and every week for the WWE Podcast Mailbag. Won't be doing a current state of WWE this fo- this coming week, as Matt is on vacation. So I will be talking to you guys next week. All right, it's time to give a huge shout out to the sponsor of today's episode, happyhippo.com. So if you guys haven't checked this out, you got to go to happyhippo.com because they have some of the highest quality Kratom products that I've ever come across. And if you guys aren't familiar with what Kratom is, it's an herbal substance that has many different uses, everything from a balanced mind to energy you can it can help you relax and my wife and I uh, over the last couple of weeks have tried out some of their products and I have to say it has improved her sleep specifically she's very anxious and her mind runs at night and it has helped her fall asleep and stay asleep she actually was using one of the uh, powders that comes in a pouch from Happy Hippo and uh, just dropped it into her water and you know off she went and she was just she, she was very happy let me just put it that way and so myself during the workday if you guys didn't know I have a big boy job I, I work uh, in, in contract management and I need that balance I need the energy during the day and they have something called Hyper Hippo and an energy shot. And those energy shots come in those little tiny bottles. You guys are familiar with it from other brands that uh, use that type of packaging, but there's nothing like this, all right? This energy shot, I take it, easy to take, and within minutes, I feel the effects. There's no massive crash after I take it either, which is a huge deal, right? How many energy drinks have you taken uh, and coffee have you drank throughout the day that just leads to the massive crash? Well, this doesn't, and it's, it's an all-natural herb. And I'm telling you right now, it will help you get through your day. It can help you relax, depending on that the type of product you're looking for. Happy Hippo delivers. And guess what? Right now, if you have an order of 200 or more, you can get free next day FedEx shipping. And also, their stuff tastes great. So check out happyhippo.com. Support the WWE podcast and Happy Hippo. And do yourself a favor as well, guys. I'm telling you right now, if it can help my wife go to sleep for somebody as anxious as she is and as somebody that needs as much energy as I do during the day to to do this podcast and to uh, do my job during the day, check out happyhippo.com. Whether you're trying to relax or whether you need energy or balance during the day, (laughs) happyhippo.com. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE Podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.